today we're doing it on the Sony Xperia 5 Mark IV. And I am very jet lagged. I'm in Berlin right now, and I spent 24 hours in New York City coming back from another trip, which was Sony Kando. Now, now we're here and I'm very tired. But we're gonna test out this phone while we explore Berlin as per the usual. But first things first. Coffee, check. Now the reason I'm in Berlin is because of IFA. Now it stands for something in German that I will butcher if I try to pronounce, but it roughly means the Berlin radio show and it's been going on since 1924. Einstein was even at the opening in 1930. Now it's now a general tech show, not just radios, of course, and it's Europe's largest tech show apparently. Now it always reminded me a bit of CES, which is the consumer electronic show in Vegas. Now, personally, I'd rather be in Berlin for a show than Vegas. And this spot where we are now is called 19 grams. And it's called 19 grams because that's how much ground coffee is in a double espresso in Australia. And it's a lovely, obviously Australian, coffee shop here in Alexanderplatz, which is the neighborhood that we're staying in for IFA. And this location even roasts the coffee for all of their other locations in Berlin. It just smells good in here. And while we're here though, let's chat a bit about the Sony Xperia 5 Mark IV. And firstly, the styling, it just feels good. I've always liked Sony Xperia phones because they have this like squared off design. They have this matte texture on the back. Plus there's something about that 21 by nine aspect ratio that the screen has. It gives it a very like tall but skinny shape compared to most phones. And it just, they just feel good. Now, as with my Sony Xperia 1 Mark IV video, which you can check out here, if you want, and apologies if you've watched it because there will be some overlap in these two videos. But this is meant to be a creator focused device. And now it just brings down the cost essentially by removing some features. And when I say bring down the cost, it, it's still expensive. We'll get to that later. And it's also more compact with a screen that's 6.1 inches instead of 6.4. Now speaking of that screen, it is still 120 hertz display, which gives you smoother scrolling and animations as well as gaming. But I'm gonna leave it off for now as that is how it is by default and I'll get to why later. Now it's an OLED display and it looks great. And apparently it's also 50% brighter than last year's. And I can confirm it is a little easier to see in daylight. Now compared to last year, we have wireless charging now, which I appreciate since I have so many wireless chargers just all over my apartment and my office. It's just, it's convenient. It also comes in three colors, black, like I have here, a white that looks kind of nice and green, which is kind of my favorite. Now haptics on the phone are actually particularly good. Typing feels good, for example. The vibrations are just well-tuned. They feel good. It feels like, you know, it's meant to mimic like you're tapping something physical, and it, it does a good job of that. Now we have a 5,000 milliamp battery instead of a 4,500 one, which we'll test out throughout this video, and a newer Qualcomm Snapdragon Gen 1 chipset over the Snapdragon 888 from last year. Now besides all that, and a couple of camera changes that we'll talk about later, we basically have the same phone from last year. We still have the micro SD card slot, an IP6568 rating, so down to 1.5 meters underwater for 30 minutes. We have the same RAM and storage configs, stereo speakers, a side mounted fingerprint sensor. We still have a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, which is more important on this phone because of that creator focus emphasis. We'll get to that later though. And finally, it runs a pretty stripped down stock version of Android, which I appreciate. There's no fluff, there's no bloatware, nothing like that. Welcome to Tempelhof. And it's called that because it sits on a piece of land that used to belong to the Knights Templar in medieval Germany. But it's now a defunct airport that was very important right after World War II, when Germany was split between multiple countries that had fought against the Germans at the time, and Berlin as the capital was also divided despite being in the middle of the Soviet territory. Now, in 1948, the Soviets decided to block all access into Berlin. It actually became the first international crisis of the Cold War. Now, the Allies didn't have anything in writing saying that they had access to the roads that the Soviets 
Soviets were blocking. So technically, they weren't doing anything legally wrong. The only thing the Allies did have in writing was three 20-mile wide air corridors in and out of West Berlin. Now, the Soviets kind of knew that it would be impossible to use these routes to provide enough supplies to Berlin and just kind of started celebrating their victory. The Allies eventually, though, concluded that they would need 5,000 tons a day of supplies from coal, diesel, and petrol to provide power to food to prevent West Berlin from starving. The Berlin Airlift, as it was called, began. During the first week, they averaged about 90 tons a day. By the second week, it reached 1,000. Planes were taking off from this airport every four minutes. And after two months, and with the help and moral support of West Berliners, the efforts of multiple allied nations, including the US, Britain, Canada, Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, and others, they managed to fly 1,500 flights a day out of Tempelhof, carrying more than 4,500 tons of cargo, which was enough to keep West Berlin supplied. Five months later, they got it to 5,000 tons a day. Eventually, the Soviets stopped the blockade. And this year-long operation would start a bond between the German people and the Allies that would play a huge role going forward with post-war Germany. Now this statue here represents the three air corridors and has the names of 39 British and 31 American pilots who died during the operation. Okay, let's talk about that creator phone concept with the Xperia 5 Mark IV by starting with the cameras. Now we get the Xperia 1 4's newer ultra-wide and main camera, and they perform basically the same. I am sad though to see the removal of the dual focal length telephoto from the Xperia 5 Mark III, which also had a larger sensor in favor of a smaller fixed one at 2.5 times telephoto on this model, instead of the 2.9 times and 4.4 times of the Mark III. That dual telephoto was something I praised them for before because of how clever that tech is, and then even more so with the Xperia 1 Mark IV being able to reach all of the ranges in between instead of just the two. Now, it could basically move the lens inside like a normal zoom camera lens compared to the locked two states of the 5 Mark III. So this just kind of feels like a step backwards for the Xperia 5, especially when it costs the same. Now, we do have a new 12 megapixel 1 by 2.9 inch sensor instead of the 8 megapixel for the front facing camera. Again, it's the same sensor as the Xperia 1 Mark IV, and that does allow for 4K video recording now and better load light. We also inherit the 120 frames per second on all of the rear lenses, which is great because you can then slow that down to up to five times slow-mo in editing without having to decide if you want slow-mo as you're shooting. We also have real-time eye and face autofocus and tracking on all of the lenses, 20 FPS with autofocus and auto exposure on all of the rear lenses with HDR, object tracking, and eye autofocus for video now as well. And we also have wider dynamic range video, which combines frames to make for better dynamic range, but at the cost of losing stabilization. Basically, we have everything the Xperia 1 Mark IV had here. Now, honestly though, I wish Sony would just push the camera hardware even more. Let's try and do one larger sensor with no others and go from 0.6 times to five times using that same telephoto zooming technology that they have in the one Mark IV. Or let's give it an APS-C sensor, right? Let's get weird. And look, I know that that's not reasonable, but that's where I wanna see them aiming and aspiring to, even if it's unattainable. Especially now that they've shown that they can be innovative with the camera hardware with these zoom lenses, more of that at least. Also, Sony makes most of the sensors in most phones. So why not use just the best hardware that they make in their phones. That giant one inch sensor everyone was excited about from the Xiaomi 12S Ultra, Sony makes that. Why is that not in an Xperia? Why not push the hardware to make up for the software limitations that they have? At some point that sheer hardware play will make the images and video better, even if the computational photography is not necessarily as good as the other guys. Now for that 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, you can actually plug in an external mic, either a shotgun mic or a wireless one like this one. Now you can use that audio directly in the footage from the phone, which of course sounds better than the internal mics. And sure, you can do this on other phones with a 3.5 millimeter two lightning or USB-C cable, but it's nice to be able to use the same gear that I would use for my alpha camera without needing anything else. That's where we're going next.
This is the Fernse Term Berlin, aka the Berlin TV Tower. It's 368 meters tall and is the tallest structure in Germany to this day and the third tallest in the EU. Now it's called the Television Tower because it was built in 1969 after taking four years to make to replace the haphazard broadcast towers throughout the city to provide a centrally located tower to provide radio station signal and obviously television station transmissions. It's visible from almost every part of the city. And there's also a restaurant here that rotates so that your view changes as you eat. You do have to pay for a reservation to get the seat and then pay for dinner. And if we're honest, it's definitely not amazing food and a bit of a tourist trap, but hey, being able to see all of Berlin from your table is kind of cool. And well, we have to have a drink in the Ferns of Term regardless, thanks to a tradition that seems to have been started by our friend. In case you guys don't know, Jaime Rivera from Pocket Now. Um, is this the most romantic dinner you've ever been on? Jesus or? Christ, dude. <laughs> I, I'm impressed. You know, I'm impressed. Not, not, I lay it on hard sometimes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just, yeah, but, you know. yeah but don't get don't get your hopes up. Oh come on, you're not. Yeah, yeah you know. Yeah. <laughs> you started to tell me a story about Ifa and Pocket Now, and potentially all of the reporters that we know coming here. Oh God, yeah. So I don't think Ifa was really on the mobile map at the beginning. It was Samsung was like the first company. With the Galaxy Note, like that was like because the really... Note launched here, right? Yeah, you mentioned that to me. I forgot. Ifa used to be a show mostly for washing machines, uh, vacuum cleaners, Got it. And, and you know televisions yeah. and stuff like that. Anton at the time, who was my boss, mm. was like, "Yeah, no, I need to go to Ifa." And I was like, "What the hell is an Ifa? Like what?" <laughs> so yeah, no, he came over, he did the show, covered the Galaxy Note, and yeah. then after that, oh, this... twelve years ago, I yeah, old, but that's fine. <laughs> after that, this became like the showground for Samsung's fall launches. But at the time. The U.S. press corps. There was U.S. press that right. were invited by IFA, but this, they were like they press, were press. CNN, yeah, yeah. Forbes. Like we were nowhere. Yeah. Again, twelve near. years ago, YouTubers weren't things. Online no. publications weren't that not at all considered. Right. And so Fisher was actually the first YouTuber to make it to that press corps. Oh crap! Yeah, nice. So Fisher was pretty much the first of us that was here from the U.S. and he made it this thing where huh. he wanted to come to the TV tower. Yep. Yeah. yeah every yeah. year to get That's drunk it. in the Ferns' turn. This is how it was born. Hey guys, it's Michael with PocketNow.com here at the Berlin TV Tower, the biggest TV antenna in Germany. Having a look out the window here, this has nothing to do with cell phones, and we'll never see the light of day. But look how high we are, and not the way you usually think I'm high. <laughs> and thus began the somewhat tradition of everybody coming to have a drink at the Fernse term during IFA. Cheers, sir. Okay, let's talk about the unique software that Sony has added to their Xperia phones meant for content creators. Okay, so firstly we have the Photo Pro app, and that's the new camera app basically, and it's a relief that they combined the basic camera app that they used to have into the Photo Pro one with just a basic mode inside now. The app is easy to use and feels like a normal camera app when you're in basic mode, which is great and makes shooting photos and videos quickly a lot easier. You can though use a virtual scroll wheel meant to mimic the one on the Sony Alpha cameras to get to more manual options like shutter priority or even full manual. And from there, you can easily change all the settings you want with on-screen controls that again, mimic the Alpha series cameras. It's definitely the best manual controls on a phone that I've seen while still giving you basic mode if you don't wanna bother. Now besides that, things start to get a bit more complicated with the software. So you can take videos in that Photo Pro app quickly and easily like you'd expect, or you can use Video Pro or Cinema Pro. Now, I can already confirm that videos taken in the Photo Pro app are in the same format and look the same as the Video Pro app, which is good. So that means that you can use Photo Pro for video quickly, since it is the app that opens when you hit the shutter button or double tap the power button. And the only reason to go into Video Pro is to live stream, which is cool, and you can do that directly in the app, which is nice, or just to use more manual controls. Now, Video Pro gives you things like ISO, shutter speed, and, and all the other things you would expect from a full manual video camera mode. And it also has a feature that I like a lot, which is the manual focus option, which allows me to do things like rack focus, which is changing the focus from one subject to another. My issue with this though, is that there's no focus peaking. And on this tiny screen, it's even harder to know what's in focus. So I I've mentioned it before, but I just, 
I want them to put it in already. Now beyond that, you have the Cinema Pro app, which is similar to the Video Pro app in that it has all sorts of manual controls, but it locks the aspect ratio at 21 by nine, and it gives you LUTs that you can use, including one that mimics the Sony Venice, which is their very expensive cinema camera. It also forces H.265 and HDR HLG formats, both of which mean more work in editing for me, so it's nothing I would really use. And if I really wanted to go that route, I'd rather they just let us shoot an S-Log in the Video Pro app on the phone, and then I can color grade that with a LUT, because there's a ton of them online for S-Log, and make it look however I wanted. And then I could also crop it to 21 by nine if I felt like it, without having to be forced into an aspect or a look and use a whole nother app. Now the relatively new app that we have in here is the Music Pro app, which apparently lets you record yourself singing with a guitar, for example, and it can send that up to Sony's servers and then separate the two tracks, one for vocals and one for the guitar. But what I want to use it for is voiceovers in these videos, as it supposedly can remove echo and background noise as well using that same Sony server round trip. Here's what that sounds like in my echoey hotel room, for example. Now, Sony also mentions that you can use HDMI out from the phone to connect it to a Sony camera and it becomes a monitor. But for most content creators that would need that, they're not gonna wanna plug in a cable when they can see the framing and control the camera remotely enough in the Imaging Edge app that will do that wirelessly on any phone. The one feature that this phone can do in conjunction with your Sony camera, or any camera or HDMI source for that matter, is it can be used as a video capture card for live streaming. So you can live stream on the go using your real camera plugged in to the phone. That is genuinely a cool and unique feature that actually replaces a piece of gear that you'd normally use to do that in a good way. Now you've actually seen this before potentially with the Xperia Pro I, whenever you've seen those very bokeh out shots on the NFL. The camera is using the Pro I to beam the signal back to the NFL truck. And for the NFL, they usually would pay a lot more for the whole setup of the camera and the steady cam and the transmitter. And so they can justify the Pro I's high cost for being a phone when they're using it in that scenario. Okay, calling it a night. Now, firstly, the phone's battery died when we were at the Burns of Term. So here is my screen on time and my usage for anyone who's curious about that from today. Now, again, keep in mind, this is a real world test and I used the camera way more than a normal day, but here is another day that was a more normal day and my screen on time and my usage for that as well. So you have something to compare it to. Now, overall, battery life wise, I will say it's probably better than the Xperia 5 Mark III, but it's still, kind of feels meh to me. It just feels like as soon as you start using those cameras, all of a sudden the battery starts to drain pretty quickly, like more so than other devices do. And maybe that has something to do with the fact that the phone overheats whenever you use the camera for any decent amount of time. It's actually kind of annoying, but I don't know. And I've said this before, I feel like Xperia is getting closer and closer to being that thing I want it to be. But for now, I feel like I just, well, I'm, I'm excited to see how Xperia evolves. Now, if you haven't checked it out already, I did a video on the Sony Xperia 1 Mark IV, and I explored a place called Industry City in Brooklyn, New York. I'll leave a link below if you wanna check that out, and I dive a little more into all of the Xperia stuff in that video as well. But there you go. What do you guys think, though? I would love to hear from you guys. Let me know in the comments below. Also, if you haven't already, please subscribe. Ding the bell so you can notify when I do new videos. Appreciate that as well. As always, though, regardless, thanks for watching. Are bottles? Someone's just throwing bottles around. Train. <laughs> Every country doesn't matter. There's the train again. At least there's small trains here. It's like a quick pew. Goes by a lot faster than say the ones in I don't know New York. Ah, but then another one comes the other way. So there goes that. All right, this. Shut up, bird the Sony Xperia 5 Mark IV train, which you can check out car, but we'll get to that later. Train, they're short, but they're often, I'm learning. European ambulances.
who sound strange to me. Europeans, do you feel that way when you come to the States? Hear that? European ambulance. Very different. Train again. Train. And a couple of camera cha- nope. Drug. Van, really. Or Renault. Don't have those in the States. And finally it runs. Bird. Bird, bird, bird. Bird is the word. And finally it runs. He's like waiting. He's just watching me from his tree. I can see him. He's just, every time I talk. And then a train. One of these days I'm gonna film a video in like the desert, just where there's no sound, just for fun. It's a girl roller skating. It's a loud music. She looks like she's having fun, for honest. Uh...